This is part two of a multi-part series on pouring a multicolor epoxy logo. We started out with initially setting up how to pour our initial coat or our pre-coat. At this point we've poured our initial pre-coat it's not really pouring, it's brushing it on. It's a clear coat. It's gotten nice and hard. We've checked that. And we're about ready to move into the point where we're actually going to carve and pour our first coat, our base coat, which is going to be black. So we'll go through the process of setting up the tool path. Carving has already been done in the previous video, so we won't spend any time on carving. And then we'll move into calculating mixing and pouring the black resin and then checking it for hardness and cover a couple lessons learned along the way. Hope you enjoy this video. So the pre-coat is all dried as you can see by the uh, looking at that material. I'll touch it. It's not tacky. It's all dry. And you can see there are some bubbles and stuff on the bottom of that. Uh, you're just not going to get all of that bubble out. Uh, when it's that thin of a coat, there's nothing to, to really pop, but that's okay because that's all going to be covered up with black and it's still 0.15 inches deep minus a, a, that little thin layer that you brushed on with the brush. As a reminder, I use this spreadsheet in part one of this video series, but I'll just do a quick rehash in case you haven't seen it at this point. If not, you should go back and look at that. So this spreadsheet took the length, width, and depth of the carve that I was going to do in the Vectrix software. I got that data straight from there. Again, check part one of the video. And calculated the amount of resin that it predicts I should use. So it's 10.65 times 5.1 times 0.15. That gives you the volume of a rectangle. And I go through the formula and I come up with 4.5 ounces I'm going to need for this pour. Experience tells me that even with uh, that calculation, I want to be extra careful and if anything, I want a little extra resin because once you've poured the initial resin and mixed it up, it's hard to match the color exactly because it's kind of a, an art, an eyeball thing when you're doing the mixing. So it's better to have more resin with some left over than to try to cheap out and just get the exact right amount. That's my experience and Shane's experience. With that said, I added 0.75 ounces to come up with 5.25 ounces that I wanted to pour. That 5.25 ounces by this formula gives you these breakdowns of 2.87 resin, 2.38 hardener, and this is just a check on the equation. And it turns out I've already done the pour. I thought I would just take a minute since I have the cup about how much resin was left over with each of my resin calculations. This was the black pour and I'm not sure how close you can see. I'll try to zoom up. But if you look at this cup, that's the one ounce marker and you can see it's less than a half ounce of worth of resin that was left after I finished the pour of black. This is the white resin and you can see that that's probably about 0.7 or 0.75 ounces of resin that I weighed in my calculation but I'm okay with that and this is the green cup and it's about 0.5 ounces of resin that was left over once I finished pouring about 0.5 ounces so that resin calculator is probably right on but I never trust it enough and I always add some additional and you can see I do have some additional left I'd rather do that than run out with that let's go mix the resin and then pour it you can see I've got my mixture ratio there. I need 2.87 resin, 2.38 hardener. I'm going to mix up 5.25 total, and I'm going to mix it in this cup right here. So that's what you'll be seeing as I videotape this next step. You won't see me. I probably won't be talking much, and uh, you'll only see parts of me because that's the way my camera setup is. I don't have room for you to see everything. So the first thing I'll do is I'll turn on the scale. You can see it says 000 right there. I put on the cup and then I tear the cup. And when I tear it, you can see it goes to zero. I'll put in the material. Let's, let's make it look like that's the material. You can see that has a weight of 2.13 ounces. It's really a black glove. Then I'll re-tear it. Hard to film and do this at the same time. I'll re-tear it. It'll go back to 000. And then I'll pour in the second mixture. So that's what you'll be seeing me doing. And then I'll have the total.
So now the next step is to stir this up nice and thoroughly, the sides. Now again, I'm using upstart epoxy, and upstart epoxy, when you look at their instructional videos, gives a clue that says, when you first stir it, it'll get cloudy. I think you can see how cloudy it is. It's also full of bubbles. Depending on the temperature, it'll take longer or less. And now you can see that although it was cloudy before, it's still full of bubbles. You can see it's starting to clear up. Shane really likes West Systems. Again, this is Upstart Tabletop Epoxy. So now it's looking fairly clear, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull it up, and you can see that the mixture is clear. It's got a bunch of bubbles in it, which makes it look cloudy, but actually the mixture itself is pretty clear. So I think I've got a good mix. Start to mix in the color. So in this case, I'm using Black Diamond, and I'm using Ecopoxy Black to make this uh, dark, uh, opaque black. So I actually use both. I'll put a few drops in here. In fact, I put a little more than I wanted to. It just came out faster than I expected, but it'll be okay with this black. And now I'm gonna put in some of this. Now be careful of this. This stuff likes to spread all over the place. So just a couple scoops. That should do it. And now we'll mix it up nice and thorough. Scraping the sides. And I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but that, that glittery part of that, that sparkly part of that black diamond wants to flake out all over. It's on my gloves and everything else. Now it's time to move on to pouring it. So one thing I wanted to check, because I have this in kind of a strange place, is that everything's still level. So I put on the level and I can see that Okay, now everything's leveled out and I can start to pour. Nothing fancy about pouring in here. We just take what we mixed up, try to make as little mess as possible. And I should have some left over. I kind of like to pour the corners a little bit first, make sure it's all flowing in the right direction. So now we've got our black epoxy poured, and we'll uh, put a torch to this every 15 minutes or so for the first hour to two hours. Okay, the bubble popping is that quick. We'll come back every 15 minutes. Looks to me like, they're, even though the level says this is level, it's wanting to go over the edge here, so I'm going to raise this corner up just a little bit more. Setting a timer for 15 minutes to come back and heat it again. Okay, let me show you what happens if you get distracted. So I got distracted and uh, I don't know whether you saw me adjusting it, but earlier I didn't really believe my scale because I saw the epoxy leveling out over to this side. So I actually raised it up even though my scale said it was off and uh, to make sure that the pour would level out inside the pocket and not go all over the place. Well, I made a mistake as you can see because while I wasn't paying attention doing some computer work, I came back to heat it up for the bubbles and my epoxy had run out. I'd, played it, I'd made it too high on this side and my epoxy had all run out over to the right. So now I've done another adjustment. I'm using this the level again, trying to believe it, and I'll have to watch this a lot closer to make sure everything levels out because we're still at that stage where things can level. Well, now that we have this mess, we've got to redistribute this epoxy back into the pocket. So that's what you're going to observe at this time is me trying to re-level. You can see how far that level off got off. I don't know whether I bumped the table or what happened. But it certainly wasn't level, and if we're going to keep this epoxy poured where we want it, we're going to have to adjust this level. I'm going to show you what I'm doing to try to save the project, because it's not too, it's not gone now. Uh, that's also, you can also see why I actually put the pre-coat past the edges. So here's what we've got to do. We're actually going to use the stir sticks and push that epoxy back in. Uh, we're going to stir it up, and we're going to, push as much of that epoxy back into the pocket that we can. Right now I'm stirring it to try to get a little swirl characteristic 
but also just to, to make sure that um, it's got a good mix in there. Mostly for the swirl. At this point, it's a messy job. That's why you got the gloves on and you're going to make a mess. Or at least I do. So you're watching me push all of this epoxy in. Then I'll be checking my level again. I'll be making sure that I'm paying much closer attention, not getting distracted. And then you'll see me put the torch on. Get those bubbles. You can see the bubbles that are in the epoxy right now. So hopefully you learn from this. Uh, I've done this a lot of times and I know that I shouldn't get distracted, but I did. In fact, I got distracted trying to make a YouTube video for this series of videos. No need to watch this section if you're uh, familiar with the heating and stuff. I just wanted to show you that things can happen and how you correct it. And now we're level again. You can see that the epoxy is flowing in the right direction. And that should be good enough. And we'll come back in 15 minutes to check it again. But I'll be paying more attention. Uh, not just waiting 15 minutes. I'll be paying attention as I sit in the room with it. Okay, it's been about 15 minutes since we uh, last stirred and, and heated it with bubbles and we pushed everything in. So now it's time to give it another stir and to actually heat it up again. The stirring helps with the swirl effect if you want swirls inside your color. You can see a few bubbles here and here. So we're going to just simply swirl. And it's getting to the point now. It's been about a half hour to 45 minutes. It's getting to the point now where I can feel it starting to get gummy. And so the ability to impact by stirring is getting uh, less and less, so I may not stir again after this. And I don't expect to see much swirl in this at all. And that's pretty much the bubble popping we're going to do. Okay, it's been 15 minutes. You can uh, see that the flow is pretty much staying within the border, just a little bit past the border everywhere. There's just a couple bubbles, not very many. If I put a stick inside the um, epoxy, it's starting to get a little gummy for me to stir anymore. I'm not going to stir anymore because I know I'm not going to get much swirl out of this. So I'm just going to go ahead and hit it with the flame one more time and see if any bubbles get popped or arrived. I don't see very many bubbles in there, so I may not need to do much more. This may be it. <laughs> That's about how fast I do it. I didn't see any bubbles coming up or popping. So that's going to be it for me uh, putting the torch on it. And now it's like uh, watching grass grow. We wait for the epoxy to harden. I'll continue to watch to see if somehow it's leveling out if I, if I didn't get the level right. Uh, and then once it hardens, uh, we'll go from there and carve the next color. So I'm looking at a couple different things when I'm trying to check this epoxy. You may recall in earlier in the video when I was demonstrating how I poured it and how it was drying that I got it on level and it has started to creep out into all of these areas and I had to brush it back in and re-level it. It looks like it turned out okay. So that's a lesson on making sure you're paying close attention to the epoxy as it's drying until it gets to the point where it's pretty hard. Key test is you want to feel the epoxy, make sure it's not gummy. And then the next thing you want to do is you want to try to put your thumbnail, thumbnail or fingernail, into the epoxy and see if it leaves a mark. If it leaves a mark when you do that, then the epoxy is still too soft to pour. And in this case, it is leaving a couple marks, so I will come back to this and I'm going to check this in another couple hours. My hope is that you picked up one or two things from this video. For now, let's cover a couple key points that I think would have been good takeaways. The first one is resin calculation techniques. 
You should use the data that you have from VCarve Pro or Aspire or whatever software you're using to help you determine how much actual resin you're going to need. It helps if you have a consistent method for doing that calculation instead of just kind of eyeballing it. I use my spreadsheet example. You could develop others or develop your own spreadsheet. When you're measuring epoxy, uh, tend to round up, not down. You'd rather have too much than too little. And that's for a couple different reasons. One is if you have to mix colors, making a consistent color match could get to be difficult if uh, you have to add epoxy after you've already poured a sufficient amount. So I already said that better too much than too little and I gave you the reason why. We looked at how you measure the epoxy by weight versus volume. So I went through the process of tearing and so forth. So if you've never done that before, I thought that might be helpful. I hope so. The key point is that always follow the manufacturer's instructions. Mixing by weight and volume are not equivalent to being the same. A one-to-one -one weight will not always be a one-to-one -one volume or vice versa. For example, in the epoxy I use, it's one part resin and 0.83 parts by weight. Mixing color. you got to be careful when you're mixing color. Too much can ruin your project and uh, if you put too much color, what I mean by that is if you put too much color like I did with the black, it could have been much worse if I was using different colors, you might have to remix a whole batch of epoxy resin. So take it slowly, one little drop at a time. It's much easier to add and you can't subtract. Leveling of the epoxy pour is critical. You saw what happened when I didn't get it level, created a mess. It could have been a lot worse. Pay close attention to that. We discuss how to fix things as they go sideways. If you catch it early enough, you can push the epoxy back in. You can deal with things like that, but it's better not to have to get yourself into that situation again. Pay attention. Don't get distracted until the epoxy is to a point where it's uh, gummy semi-hard and you're not going to have to deal, deal with it or worry about it moving. Stirring and bubble popping, we discussed that. You want to pop your bubbles with your torch. You don't want to overheat it. It's just a quick brush of the torch. You saw I never spent a lot of time over it. You can cook your epoxy. Once you cook your epoxy, it won't cure properly. It'll get a skin over it and the chance for bubbles increases versus popping them. Uh, you're actually going to increase the bubbles. The stirring, the stirring you saw me do is primarily for a swirl effect. It also helps a little bit with the bubbles, but mostly it's for a swirl effect and you didn't see much swirl effect effect in this three color epoxy but if you look at some of Shane's Shane Peters work and if you look at some of my earlier projects like my ring core flag or my blue line flag you'll see uh, swirling in there and that is a really impressive technique. After sufficient time you want to check your epoxy hardness. What I mean by sufficient time is typically depending on your epoxy manufacturer they'll tell you how long it takes to cure and get hard. Uh, don't assume just because you've gone that amount of time that it's going to be hard because you could have actually uh, had a wrong mixture, your epoxy could be old, there could be lots of reasons why it's not hardening. So you don't just assume that. You have to actually test for hardness. I provided a thumbnail test for checking for hardness. That seems to work. For me, I actually learned that again from Shane about checking for hardness. So you want to make sure that's the case. If not, you'll end up with a gummy carve. It won't work right when you go to carve your next color. So make sure you check for hardness. In my case, in this one, I actually checked for hardness after about 14 hours which is normally plenty hard for me but for some reason it wasn't until I had about actually 17 or 18 hours of dry time before my epoxy was as hard as I wanted it to be to carve. So next video is my next video part three. I'll be focusing on the tool pass for the second color carve which is white. We'll then focus on carving the white and what to look for as you're carving. We'll look at the mixing of the white color and how I get to the type of color that I'm going to mix. Input that I got from Shane Peters. I will, we'll look at special techniques needed when pouring in small detail areas to help improve your opportunity for success. There's a challenge with getting the epoxy into those areas to make sure that you don't end up with bubbles and then you have to try to figure out how to fix it later down the road. So uh, we won't cover things that we've already covered sufficiently enough in the first two videos, which is uh, epoxy calculation. I won't go through my spreadsheet. I won't go through stirring up and mixing of the epoxy, although I'll go through the, the color selection. I won't go through mixing it up. Then we'll go through, uh, and anything else I feel is, is redundant, I'll, I'll skip that. It's been my pleasure to share the information in this video. Hopefully it provided one or two tips that you might be able to use. If there's anything else you think you would have liked me to put into the video that wasn't, please leave a comment. 
I would appreciate it if you would like, comment, share, or subscribe if you like this video. Have a wonderful day.